This is chapter 17, Geriatric Emergencies. It's also going to include a little bit on our special patients, so at-home patients with special needs. Um, so uh, kind of to wrap this up, we had our pediatric and our geriatric, a little bit of, of special patients. So these are outside of the norm of the adult patients that you'll be taking care of. And in this chapter, we're going to cover geriatrics as well as uh, special, uh, special challenges with patients and as well as reporting abuse and neglect. So uh, for definition, a geriatric patient is a patient who's older than 65 years of age. So that's a number. I mean, you may see patients that are 55 um, that look like they're 80. You know, they've got a lot of medical problems. And then you may see an 80-year-old that's running marathons. So don't think of just that number as, oh, that's, you know, old and decrepit. Um, it's just a number. Uh, in by 2010, more than 40 million people um, are over 65 years of age, so it's the graying of America, the baby boomers um, retiring. Uh, so you kind of see a big bubble going through there. Age is a nat natural process, um, but it is decline in functions of the body systems. So one thing that you want to do as you encounter uh, geriatric patients is not to prejudge that they're going to have physical or mental or emotional problems. Um, you want to, you know, assess every patient on their own merits. Uh, most EMS systems respond to a lot of uh, patients that are geriatric. Um, a lot of times they don't have the resources, uh, family members that live nearby, so EMS becomes their first responder. So looking at some of the changes of aging, and probably two of the most that has to do with sensory changes are hearing and sight. Um, so a lot of people that are older will have some type of, of hearing loss, and whether they wear glasses or contacts or, uh, you know, go through life with trouble um, seeing from cataracts or whatever, um, that can impact their life. So driving, walking, uh, you know, leaving the house sometimes becomes uh, kind of a big, big deal for them. Also, that impaired vision and sometimes memory and confusion um, contribute to making mistakes, taking medication. So we look at a, a medication error. <coughs> And it's based on, did they take the wrong medication or did they take uh, too much or not enough of a medication? So these little containers that have the Sunday through Monday thing and uh, they have morning and afternoon, those are really good uh, for keeping track of you've already taken your medication so you don't double dose um, that medication. Patients that have hearing impairment um, and so older people have a decline sometimes in, in hearing and the surprising thing about this is, um, you, you know, you can talk louder um, and it's not going to make a bit of difference. The two things that factor in uh, for communication is um, people with deeper voices, so men uh, are heard easier than women with a high-pitched voice uh, because that high decibel hearing loss is attributed to higher tones, uh, so they don't hear that as well. Um, and if you face them, they can hear, you know, just by not so much reading your lips, but um, hearing some of the words and seeing some of the lip movement makes a lot more sense for them. So um, if you can get closer to their ear, that helps a lot. Um, and again, not turn your back when you're speaking to them. For somebody that's, you know, that's actually hearing impaired and deaf that may have to learn sign language, um, that helps. So there's some key things that you can... Uh, resources that you can find for communication at least get the basics down but having like a marker board with a marker that you can communicate back and forth like that that works quite well too assuming that they're old enough to read and write patients that are visually impaired look for signs that they may have you know really thick eyeglasses that maybe they don't have on at the time which means you know boy they're here their vision is going to really be impaired if they don't have those Maybe they have a cane, doesn't have to be a white cane, or a service dog. Um, one thing to say about service dogs, if you transport the patient, the service dog goes with them. I mean, you wouldn't take somebody to the hospital without their eyeglasses or their hearing aid, so you don't take them with you without their service dog. Service dog rides in the ambulance with the patient. They go everywhere. You know, restaurants that say no dogs allowed, service dogs are an exception. A lot of times, um, somebody that's visually impaired that has a medical emergency, you know, they're going to be specific, especially uh, vulnerable at that time. 
So make sure that you communicate well. Tell them everything that's going on. I'm going to take your blood pressure now. I'm going to put the cuff on you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and close the doors. I'm going to put some seat belts on you. You know, let them know all the time uh, what you're doing. And if they have any aids that help, make sure that you take those with, with you. Uh, communicating with older patients, take things a little slower. You know, we, we rustle and we bustle. And, you know, you can think about this going to a grocery store. You want to run in and get five things. You grab a little basket and you run, run, zip, zip, zip. And there's somebody in your way that's moving slow. And you're like, oh, again. You know, but that's their world. They slow down because every step, you know, needs to be um, patterned. It needs to be uh, deliberate. If they trip and fall, that could mean a wrist that breaks or a hip that breaks. So um, just kind of take things a little bit slower. Introduce yourself. Use their name. Show respect, Mr. or Mrs., until they give you permission to use um, their first name or a nickname. Uh, and listen to them. You know, they have a story that they want to tell you of what's going on with them. Um, so listen to them. It's not a good idea to talk to your patient, uh, talk to your partner, or talk to another family member as if they're a child. And they recognize that as demeaning. So, uh, you know, try to avoid that. Some problems that uh, the elderly may have as they age is a, a loss of density in the bones. So they lose muscle strength. The disc between the vertebrae will narrow. Um, they start losing a lot of that cartilage in between there uh, and that disc. Um, the uh, small fractures in the, cur in the upper spine, in the cervical spine, as well as the upper thoracic spine, uh, they'll have small fractures which result in a curvature of the spine called kyphosis. And then just loss of flexibility. A lot of times, you know, you take your arm and raise it straight up. That may be very hard for them to do. Uh, sometimes a loss of balance, um, just their center of gravity sometimes changes, so it makes uh, falling an issue. In fact, um, so motor vehicle crashes still account for the majority of uh, traumatic injuries for the elderly, uh, but falls are right up there. You know, it can be, most of the time it's a fall on the same level, they just trip and fall. Uh, some people actually report that they broke their hip and fell, like they felt it snap. Well, hip fractures tend to be more of an upper femur rather than a true hip. Um, so we think about those slow movements, you know, lend a helping hand, you know, if we want to move them into, onto a stretcher or, you know, ready them for transport, you know, don't rush them. Help them sit down, you know, help them move that in that uh, direction. Uh, fractures are frequently and, and common uh, because of that osteoporosis, that loss of bone density. Um, so when somebody falls especially, you may try to, to stop their fall, break their fall by putting out their hands and that's where the wrists break. Um, sometimes uh, fractures of the spine. And then again that upper femur, the hip, those are particularly co common. <clears throat> Geriatric patients may have a diminished awareness of pain. So what you and I would describe maybe of 8 of 10 pain, they may be saying it's a 4. They have not only a diminished awareness of pain but also uh, temperature and thirst and hunger and a lot of the sensations that we take for granted. Um, you know, you hear about in the summertime how, you know, three, three elderly people would die in Chicago. Chicago's not very common to have um, air conditioning because it's usually so cool. And they get upwards in the high 80s and high temperature and uh, the elderly may not have the ability to cool themselves. Not a fan, not air conditioning, but they don't realize that they're really hot and they end up dying from a heat stroke. So, a lot of those things will factor in. Uh, hip fractures are more common in women than in, than in men, uh, but it can happen to either one. So one thing that you'll look for is that injured leg is usually shorter uh, than the other leg. And then in a fracture, the toes are, are externally rotated, so the foot is, is lateral, is kind of out. The toes are pointing to the side, and, and that's a sign that of a hip fracture. Uh, splint it. Um, be real careful about putting the elderly on a backboard. Um, that backboard, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's no cushioning to it. And the elderly are real prone to um, ulcers, to pressure ulcers. So where their heels are laying on something very firm or their coccyx, their tailbone is laying on something very firm, it can actually create a sore. So you always want to pad. Um, table 17.1 talks about some common uh, disabilities that you see with age.
and I think we talked about all of those uh, other than loss of bowel or bladder. A lot of uh, older people have to wear diapers because of that incontinence that they have. Um, they're, they usually have the immune systems become less effective, so it's harder for them to fight off uh, diseases. So you have to be real careful about you know, going from call to call to call and maybe not decontaminating yourself well and then you know you carry a disease that you uh, transmit to that older person. Uh, heart disease is very common in, in uh, older people mainly because the heart loses its ability uh, to respond to needs of the body. So the ability to speed up, uh, the ability to pump more blood efficiently because of that atherosclerosis or that buildup of the fatty deposits in the heart itself. Um, so they're more prone to heart attacks, angina, and congestive heart failure. It's the same process that atherosclerosis that causes heart disease can cause strokes as well as abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, so we know that strokes present oftentimes with a headache, with uh, altered mental status, uh, maybe with facial droop and weakness on one side of the body, whereas that abdominal aortic aneurysm, the triple A we call it, is a pulsating mass uh, right above the navel uh, because of the layers of the artery, the aorta, um, that's you know descending through the abdomen, kind of has weakened walls and, and kind of protrudes out. If that ever ruptures, um, you know, they die from internal bleeding really, really quick. So um, some signs that they may have are some flank pain and just general, you know, weakness because of the lack of blood flow. In respiratory diseases, as uh, people age, that alveoli loses some of that elasticity. In fact, over the age of 30, we lose about 2% of our pulmonary function every year. Um, so when you see people that, you know, they're 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever, and they're marathon runners, they're, they're very efficient with um, transferring that oxygen for carbon dioxide uh, with those respirations. Uh, the muscles become weaker, and then they may have respiratory diseases, some of them chronic, uh, like asthma or congestive heart failure, even though it's really a cardiac problem, it results in that pulmonary edema fluid in the lungs because the heart's unable to pump it through the lungs um, efficiently. Um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like chronic bronchitis or emphysema, those are chronic problems that have occasional flare-ups, whereas they may also have acute respiratory diseases. So patients that have COPD, they have that condition. It doesn't go away. And something, we call it exacerbation, something sets off an episode. Kind of like an asthma attack, something sets that off. Um, so it could be cold, could be dust, could be stress. It could be a lot of different things that make um, their situation worse. Whereas acute respiratory diseases um, strike pretty quickly with the elderly. And a, and a very common one for, for the elderly uh, is pneumonia. So they'll usually present with a productive cough, difficulty breathing, and that productive cough, meaning that they spit something up, a lot of times it's thick or we call purulent, um, like a green thick sputum. Uh, and they may have a fever, and those are pretty, pretty common signs of pneumonia. Now there is a pneumonia vaccine, it's a one-time vaccine that helps prevent that life, lifetime immunity. Um, so treating respiratory disease, uh, position, you know, let them sit up if that's the most comfortable position for them. Um, high concentrations of oxygen, should you have access to that. And the uh, biggest thing is arrange, arrange for transport. Cancer can strike any age in any part of the body, but people that are older are more susceptible. Um, and there's some complications that can set in, like they can be in acute pain. Uh, they can have difficulty breathing, signs of shock. Um, so somebody that has cancer that has a flare-up of one of the uh, complications of it, uh, they need to prompt transport and, uh, and treatment. A lot of different things can cause altered mental status in the elderly. It could be lack of oxygen to the brain. Maybe it could be low blood sugar. Or maybe it just is that they're really, really cold. Uh, so a number of things could do this. So look at the sign, signs and symptoms and, uh, you know, kind of develop a... a a step-by-step -step ABC and here's what I'm going to do about it. Uh, medication, so a lot of people um, have, uh, we call it a bag of meds, 
you're like, oh, do you take any medication? And they bring out a number of bottles of pills. Um, so it's really hard to go through each one and say, oh, this is for blood pressure and this is for diabetes and this is for cholesterol. And uh, sometimes the names are generic and sometimes they're uh, trade names or brand names, so they won't have the same name, but they may mean the same thing. Especially if, if uh, a patient goes to different doctors, they may prescribe the same medication just under a different name. So that could create, you know, kind of a double dosing of that. And then sometimes people don't take their medications as instructed. A lot of people that live on a fixed income, you know, have to make that decision of, well, do I pay for this really expensive medication or do I pay my electric bill? Uh, so you'll see them kind of shortcutting, cutting the pills in half, making them last longer um, just because of a financial issue. So you may have to ask them, well, which one of these do you take? Uh, because, again, with the finances, you know, if they change meds, they don't throw them away. Because if they ever need that med again, then they don't want to have to purchase it again. They already have that. If you are going to transport, gather up all the meds in a bag in some kind of container and make sure it goes to the hospital with them. Patients that have long-term uh, chronic conditions, and they may be elderly or they may be of any age, um, we call those, you know, homebound patients that... Um, have special needs or special challenges. And some of them that we'll talk about is maybe a patient that's on a home ventilator or on supplemental oxygen at home, uh, somebody that has a surgically inserted breathing tube again the, on the ventilator, or different kind of monitors. So um, people with heart conditions may have pacemakers implanted or automatic defibrillators implanted. Uh, there's instances where these go off on their own, and it's not so much that they're in a rhythm that sets it off. It's that that these defibrillators are programmed to go off at a certain heart rate. So if that patient gets a little dehydrated or their um, heart rate increases for any reason, those defibrillators can go off. Uh, tubes that are inserted into a vein, um, you know, for medication sometimes, or tubes that are inserted into um, the stomach to provide uh, feeding, most of the time, they have a caregiver with a, uh, you know, emergency contact uh, should something go wrong with those. But a lot of times people panic and you're the first one that they call. Um, and a catheter that goes into the, the bladder to drain urine from the patient, uh, sometimes those can become clogged or, uh, and need changing. And a lot of times, again, you're the first one that, that, that they call. Uh, so usually there's a caregiver a family member or again an, uh, an emergency number that you can call when you get there but i will walk you through some of these that kind of you know what you should do when you first get there so some of them like maybe somebody's defibrillator that's going off um, as much as i tell you if you touch them it's not going to hurt you it's really hard to still touch them because you don't hear the you know the charging of the aed you know, you don't hear any of that. It just goes off. And uh, it's scary for them. It's scary for you when it happens. But trust me on this. If you sit them down, if you lay them down and reassure them, hey, it's okay, we're here. Uh, we're going to, you know, assess you. The ambulance is coming. And, uh, you know, we're going to take good care of you. Just by doing that slows their heart rate and maybe it doesn't go down. when It won't go off again. If somebody's on a home ventilator, and the alarm starts sounding, there's a couple of reasons that it does. It's either equipment problem or that their tube into their throat, uh, usually it's in the, in the neck, um, has become clogged. Um, so the first thing you want to do is remove the connection from the ventilator to the patient and then take the mask off of your bag and that port fits right on that adapter in their neck and then you can breathe for them until further help arrives. All ventilators have an emergency contact number on them, so you'll contact them, somebody will show up. If it's from an obstruction, then EMT, somebody in uh, EMS will come and um, help clear that um, catheter that they breathe through um, with fluids, a little bit of, of what we call a saline bullet, and suction that out. Uh, so don't let this stuff scare you too much. There's usually some family member who kind of knows something about it, and then there's emergency numbers uh, to contact. If it affects airway breathing circulation, you gotta get right on those. Again, a ventilator, you would breathe for them. And some of the other things, um, you know, it's not so much of a big deal to say, well, let's transport you. 
Um, it seems to be leaking some fluid around this tube. Let's, you know, bandage that and then get you to somebody who really knows um, how to take care of this. Uh, so don't get overwhelmed or distracted by the complex equipment. Look for resources um, to help you through that. Uh, some patients have um, history of depression, and uh, especially in the older in the older adults, um, it occurs in about six percent of the geriatric population, and a lot of it is um, because they find themselves alone. You know, they'll actually say, "Well, all my friends are dying. My kids don't come visit me anymore. They're widows or widowers." Um, so those things kind of contribute to that. Maybe they have a health condition and they know that, you know, they're not going to get any better from this. So they feel like they don't have a whole lot of, of hope. Uh, so be, be attentive to that. You know, if, if you hear that in their voice that they don't have much hope for life, that in and of itself is probably a reason uh, to transport them into the hospital. And uh, we talk about suicide. Suicide can happen at any age, of course. And we think of the young that, you know, maybe had something really uh, serious happen in their life. But older men actually have the highest suicide rate of any age group in the United States. And they tend to take what we call more uh, lethal or uh, deliberate means, um, maybe like with a gun or a hanging or, you know, cutting vessels and bleeding out. And uh, there's some con the factors that can contribute to this. Um, and, you know, they don't really see a way out from it. They don't see that tomorrow can be any better. Uh, so attempted suicide, of course, we want to, you know, treat and transport those. Uh, and suicides where there's already a uh, mortal finding, um, then for the most part call law enforcement. And it's still a crime scene, a suicide, homicide. Those are still crime scenes until proven otherwise. Uh, but if somebody talks about, you know, I just don't have anything to live for. I just don't want to see tomorrow. You know, if a person is at risk to themselves or others, then against their will, you can transport them to the hospital. You would want to contact law enforcement to, you know, tell them what's going on, and they'll help you. And sometimes you have to restrain them uh, to take to transport them, but then that's the only way that you're going to get them help. If you go, well, you know, I can't transport him against his will, the next call you get is going to be uh, for trauma uh, that he fl inflicted to himself. The definition of dementia is a decline in mental function. Uh, so it could be impairments in memory, it could be impair impairments of judgment. Uh, for the most part, we think of, think of it as a memory problem and uh, inability to do regular functions that they used to do. So people over the age of 85 about a third of these have some some degree of dementia and uh, some of the causes could be of some maybe some small strokes that they had or hardening of the arteries and atherosclerosis or even hereditary Alzheimer's is the most common uh, type of dementia and it's a chronic degenerative disorder one thing to think about dementia and, and Alzheimer's is um, they don't get better so um, it's not only impaired memory that they can't remember what they ate or new people that they meet they won't remember they can remember long term better than they can remember short term but it's also a, an impairment of behavior and thinking and a lot of older people will regress and kind of act like a child and when you're you know maybe it's your grandmother or a family member and you tell them no you can't do that or have that then they say I want to have that you know and kind of throw a little uh, temper tantrum like you would see a child um, and it's really hard to try to reason uh, with somebody with Alzheimer's and probably the best thing is just to you know orient them every day who you are uh, why you're there uh, where they're at what day it is days important to them um, and you know that's that's kind of just reorientation almost every day several times a day that you have to do that because in the terminal stages uh, people with Alzheimer's can't follow commands as far as exercises so they they develop contractures of the arms and legs they're not going to be able to walk they won't have control over their bowels or bladder they'll be bed bound and maybe on a feeding tube um, and people like this really need care and support of the family but it's hard on the family too because the loved one that they knew is gone 
um, this you know the the memories of them the way they want to remember them are gone um, just treat everybody that you meet with respect and um, remember you know these are people that you're going to come in contact maybe for 20 minutes maybe an hour of their life and that's it you may see them again as a patient but you know I think we could be nice to anybody and respectful to anybody for that amount of time uh, patients that are put in hospice have um, long-term or what we call terminal illnesses and they're expected to die. There's no recovery for them. Um, so this program is much more than just uh, the medical needs. It's physical, emotional, uh, spiritual, social, economic, as well as for the family who are watching their loved ones pass. Uh, on the medical side, it may be medications, it may be uh, medication patches, um, it may be um, feeding, it may be, uh, you know, making sure they don't end up with bed sores. So, usually EMS is called if the patient has unexpected problems, uh, especially if they're in pain or um, they're struggling to breathe. A lot of times, if you do get called and um, it looks like somebody is terminal, you know, they're in a hospital bed, uh, maybe they're diapered, uh, maybe they're pretty emaciated, you know, there's not a whole lot of body left to them. And, uh, you know, they stop breathing and the family panics and calls 911. When you get there, you do your assessment, real quick you need to ask, do they have advanced directives or what we call an out-of-hospital resuscitate, do not resuscitate order? Uh, because if they do, it's a form that's signed by their physician as well as who, maybe them or their power of attorney, saying that uh, when my heart stops, I don't want any heroic me measures. Um, if they have that, then you would not do anything for them. Your attention then is turned to the family. I'm so sorry. It looks like they've passed. You know, make sure that you check the pulse, uh, and they have no pulse. Um, but if there's any problems with that advanced directive, if um, it's torn, if it's crumbled up, maybe the person themselves wanted to change their mind and that was their way of doing it. If it's not signed, they didn't sign it or the physician didn't sign it, then it's not valid. If there's signs of homicide or suicide, then it's not valid because now it's a crime scene. Uh, so you would go ahead and err on the side of starting CPR. Um, if that ever happens, it's a good idea to start compressions, contact online medical control, or the patient's physician right away. It's actually better to call their physician if you can um, because they're going to know more about the patient. And if the families, and sometimes it happens, half the family wants you to do something and half wants you to do nothing, um, a lot of times you can hand the phone to the family member and the physician talks to them and then, okay, okay, I understand, I understand, and then the decision is made, okay, let's stop compressions. Elder abuse um, is common because of the needs of, uh, could be a parent or grandparent or an older person um, that someone is caring for, but they, come up, they become really dependent on that person um, and they're at higher risk because of that. Uh, abuse may be physical, sexual, emotional, but also by neglect. Somebody not coming by and checking on them, um, not helping them with daily activities, uh, but outright physical abuse, maybe bruises, burns, a trauma, um, if sexual if it's to the genital area, and then the signs of neglect, you know, um, not somebody not being able to provide the basics for them. They don't have toothpaste, so they're not brushing their teeth, uh, they're not brushing their hair. I see a lot of women, um, as the hormones change, and they end up with long hairs on their chin. And I always think of that, you know, especially women that always, when they were younger, would never have gone out of the house without makeup or their hair done or whatever. And now they have these straggly hairs at their chin. And I think, well, you know what? That is that is a form of abuse. Whoever's caring for them, you know, doesn't um, take that time, that consideration to fix them up the way that they would. So our role in this, if you suspect abuse, probably not hairs on the chin, but something more, more important than that, uh, is to report it. If you transport the patient to the hospital, then report your findings. Report how you found the house. Maybe they had, maybe they were hoarders. Maybe they had 40 cats and the house has become unsafe. Um, and there's a lot of programs in the community for physical assistance, um, for home health, maybe a couple of hours a day if they qualify. 
and nutritional support, the Meals on Wheels programs are a place that they can go and have one good, hot, uh, well-balanced meal a day, and then also for emotional help. A lot of churches will, will, will provide this, and I always thought it's really neat, like if you could do an adopt a grandparent, uh, but then there's always some weirdos that get in there and mess that up. So um, EMS becomes that first responder for a lot of people um, that don't have other resources. So just in summary, uh, aging is a natural process. We talked about fractures and medical problems um, sometimes that they have. Don't overlook those signs of mental health, and depression tends to be a big one that you may see. Just a little review. When caring for an older person who's hearing impaired, you should speak very loudly to be sure the patient can hear you. Well, that one is good, but, you know, that's assuming that they have hearing loss. We'll put a maybe on that one. Speak directly into the patient's ear or maintain eye contact for lip readers. I like that one. Just lean a little bit closer into their ear as you speak. Assume the patient can read lips. That's kind of a, a gift. It's kind of a good talent. Not attempt to communicate because it will only frustrate the patient. And the best answer there is to get a little bit closer to their ear and then make eye-to-eye -eye contact as you speak. Fractures occur frequently in the geriatric population due to a condition that weakens the bones known as syncope. Syncope is a fancy word for fainting. Osteoporosis, then that's the... Um, thinning of the bones. They're not as dense as they used to be. They kind of become more porous. That's a good answer. Uh, dementia is uh, uh, deterioration of their cognitive functions, the memory, and uh, as well as behavior, and then dislocation would not be it. Best answer there is osteoporosis. Which of the following statements regarding suicide in the elderly is most accurate? Older women have the highest rate of suicide. No, the slide said men. Uh, most elderly people seek counseling when they become depressed. Um, actually, they don't. They don't know that it's a problem until um, they seek help for it, so they, they don't. Elderly patients tend to be more, tend to use more lethal means than younger patients, and, and we saw that in the slides that that's correct. Alcohol abuse is not a contributing factor, and it is. So the best answer there is they tend to use uh, more deliberate, more lethal means than younger patients. This wraps it up for geriatrics and our uh, special challenges patients and as well as our special populations.